So in this video, we're going to talk still more about uh, section 3.6. We're going to find the derivative of an inverse function. This is, I think, one of the trickier things that we do in AP Calculus. So uh, it may be that you need to hear this uh, more than once and try it, because it, it's, a, it's a bit of a tough idea. So let's go back and recall a little bit of what we learned in our AP prep days. What's known as an invertible function, some a function whose inverse is a function. They are sometimes called one-to-one -one functions. And we also know that those are strictly monotonic functions. And to be strictly monotonic, to be able to uh, pass both the vertical line test to be a function and the horizontal line test to be a one-to-one -one function, the function has to either always increase or always decrease. So this is a hard idea in, in AP Prep to try to decide sometimes if a function is a one-to-one -one function. Is it always increasing or always decreasing? But with calculus, we have now much more tool, much more, um, many more tools and better tools. So we can look at the derivative. If our derivative is always greater than or equal to zero, then that means the function is always increasing. Now it's okay for the function, for the derivative to be equal to zero at an occasional point, but it could not be equal to zero for an interval. That is, you can't have a function that has a horizontal line because now that's not gonna pass our horizontal line test. It's not gonna be a one-to-one -one function. But it's okay for something like an x cubed graph it's okay for there to be a derivative of zero at a point or even at several points, but not on an interval. Likewise, we could say, ask the question, is f prime of x always negative? Because then the function would always be decreasing. So let's see what we're about here. We're going to take a look at this and see what some of the issues are. So the question is, is f of x equals x cubed plus x plus 1 a 1 to 1 function? Well, with our newfound idea here, what we're going to do is take the derivative, and that's going to be 3x squared plus 1. Now, we can see that no matter what you plug in for x, x squared is going to be positive, times a positive 3 is still positive, plus 1 is still going to be positive, so this is going to be greater than or equal to 0 for all x. So that means this function is always increasing, and so that means that, yes, it is uh, going to have an inverse. Now, the, the challenge, though, is can we find the inverse? Can we find the inverse? Well, uh, our strategy, our tried and true strategy, is to switch the x and y and then try to solve for y. Hmm, this is tough. And the problem is we can't. So even though we know it has an inverse function, we can't find the inverse. So to answer the question, can we find the inverse, no. But what's crazy, or kind of cool, depending, I guess, on how you look at it, uh, we can still find, we can still find, with the aid of technology, with a graphing calculator, something like, now here's some weird notation here. I'm going to say, here's the der inverse derivative, and we'll say evaluated at, what number am I looking for? Oh, and I lost it there at 11. So we are going to try to find the derivative of the inverse at 11. But I'll come back to that. First, let's do something that we know how to do, and or one where we can find the inverse and get the derivative. And there's an important relationship between the derivative of the inverse and the derivative of the function. So first, let's consider uh, a function that we're more familiar with f of x is equal to x cubed. And so we can then know that its inverse is going to be the cube root of x. Those are inverses of each other. So if we wanted to know, say, um, the derivative, here's this weird notation, the derivative of the inverse, say, at 8, then we know that we could 
uh, find our F inverse derivative is going to be the power rule applied to x to the one-third. That's one-third x to the negative two-thirds, which for evaluation purposes might be nicer to think of as 1 over 3 times the cube root of x squared. So if we want to find that at 8, f inverse, uh, well, first maybe let's, yeah, f inverse at 8, f inverse prime at 8 is going to be 1 over 3 times the cube root, and I'm going to do the cube root of 8 first and then square that. We can do it either order, but this keeps the numbers a little more manageable. So the cube root of 8 is 2. <coughs> Excuse me, 2 squared is 4. 4 times 3 is 12. So that derivative is 1 12. So notice, when we plug 8 into the inverse function, so f inverse of 8 is the cube root of 8 is 2. So at the point 8, 2, our derivative, which is the slope of the tangent line there, is 1 12. Now, if we compare that to, say, f of 2 is going to be 2 cubed is 8. So at the point 2, 8 on the cube function, let's uh, compare what the derivative is there. So f prime of x for x cubed is 3x squared. f prime at 2 is going to be 3 times 2 squared is 12. So let's see what's going on here. I'm going to give you a visual with this as well. This is an important idea with inverses. So here is our cube function right there. So that's what we're calling f of x. And I'm going to say here is our cube root function, which is going to look something like that. This is our what we're calling the inverse function. So we're seeing that, now my scaling isn't great here, but say at 2, at 2, and 8, then at this point right here, we're getting that slope of the tangent line is really steep. It's going to be 12. Meanwhile, at the point where we switch the x and y, so we had 2, 8 on the function, at 8, 2, the slope of the tangent line to that curve is going to be its reciprocal. It's 1 12th. So I think if you imagine, you know, like we have uh, many times in, in the past in, I don't have another good color to use here, but if you imagine this line y equals x, which we know if we reflect the, the original function, the yellow curve, in that line y equals x, it lies on top of the green curve, the inverse. And uh, then you can also see that when you flip that yellow curve and the tangent line, the red line with it, the red line would then end up lying on top of the blue line. Whew, that's kind of crazy stuff. Now here is another way, a different way of finding this uh, derivative of the inverse. So I wanted to do this, what we just did here, so you can see that relationship, that the derivative of the the function, so the derivative of the function at the point 2, 8 is the reciprocal at of the as the derivative of the inverse at where you switch the ordered pair around at that place. So let's now go back and let's think of what we know about inverses. And for notation purposes, what we usually do is we'll just name f inverse g because otherwise our notation, as you can see here, gets kind of awkward. What we know about inverse functions is that f of f inverse of x must be equal to x. So if we differentiate this expression, we use a chain rule on the left. We're going to get the derivative of the outside function, leave the inside function alone. Remember that g is representing our inverse times the derivative of the inver uh, inverse, which is g prime of x, and is equal to the derivative of x, which is 1. So we can solve for this g prime, which is our derivative of the inverse, and what we get is 1 over f prime of g of x. So this is how we're actually going to find 
the derivative of the inverse most of the time. If we want to know what is g prime of, remember this is now our inverse, g prime of 8, which is what we said here. So g prime of 8, which is our derivative of the inverse evaluated at 8, what we would do is take 1 over f prime of g of 8. Now remember, g of 8 is f inverse of 8. So we know that when x is 8 for the inverse and 2 is the y value, that means that we'll get switched around. So we're going to get 1 over f prime of 2. Okay, and then finding a prime, that's not hard to do. We found that earlier, and when we plugged in 2, we saw that's how we got that 1 12. Hmm. Let's see what this means for us. We're going to come back to this uh, problem that we had earlier. We're going to revisit this function, and we're going to try to find its derivative at 11. Now we made, we're going to need our calculator for this as well, but I'm going to go to a new screen. So remember, f of x is equal to x cubed plus x plus 1. We're trying to find the derivative of the inverse evaluated at 11. I'm going to run through the derivation of this derivative of the inverse again because this is, uh, I would recommend remembering how to construct it like we are here rather than trying to memorize it. So for notation purposes, I'm going to rename the inverse as g of x. Because f of f inverse of x equals x, we're going to start with that. When we differentiate this, we're going to get f prime of g of x times g prime of x is equal to 1. We'll divide to get g prime by itself, and get g prime of x is 1 over f prime of g of x. Now, what we're saying then is to find... Sorry about that, and I'm back. I hit the wrong thing with my left hand here. So we're going to try to evaluate this. I'm going to try to evaluate this at 11. So that means our x value is 11. So we're finding g prime of 11. Remember, g is the inverse, so g prime is the derivative of the inverse. What we want is 1 over f prime of g of 11. Now, in, this, in these problems, this is really the hard part. How in the world do we evaluate f inverse of 11 when we can't find f inverse? And the answer to that question is, if 11 is an input value for the inverse, it is also an output value for the function. So we're going to set 11 equal to x cubed plus x plus 1. And here's where our graphing calculator is going to come in handy. So I would, I mean, you could graph this as y1 and this is y2 and find the point of intersection. I think it's a little easier if you subtract that 11 to the other side and now take to your calculator x cubed plus x minus 10. You can graph that and then see where it crosses the x-axis. And if you use your uh, calculate the zero option on your calculator, you should end up, I believe, getting that x is negative 2. So if 11 is a y value for the function and leads to an x value of negative 2, so if that's an ordered pair for f, that means 11, that means 11 negative 2 is an ordered pair for the inverse which means that f inverse of 11 is negative 2, which means we're going to find f prime of negative 2. Now, this is not hard because the derivative of f is not terribly difficult. That's going to be 3x squared plus 1. So evaluating that derivative at negative 2 is going to be negative 2 squared is 4 times 3 is 12 plus 1 is 13. 
So that makes our derivative of the inverse evaluated at 11 1 13th. Let's try one more of these because these are tricky. So let's say we have, uh, so here's a new example. Let's say f of x is equal to x to the third plus 3x minus 5, and we are going to try to find the derivative of the inverse evaluated at 9. So if you want to try this on your own, you might want to pause the video. Otherwise, I'm going to blaze on. So I'm going to recreate this again because I think this is so important. I'm going to say that g of x is equal to f inverse of x. So f of g of x is equal to x, which means that f prime of g of x times g prime of x is equal to 1, which means that g prime of x is 1 over f prime of g of x. So what we are trying to find is g prime of 9, which means we have to find 1 over f prime of g of 9. This is, in general, the hard part. We're trying to figure out what is f inverse of 9, and we don't know what f inverse of x is. But since we know f of x, we'll use 9 as a y value for f, and we will use our calculator. I'm going to do it you know, finding the 0, so that will make this x cubed plus 3x and I think that's going to be a minus 14. So when we use our calculator to find that, I believe we get, what do we get? I believe we get x is 9. So uh, did I do that right? No, x is 2. Sorry about that. So 2 cubed is 8. 2 times 4 is 6, 8 plus 6 is 14, minus 14 is 0. So that means f inverse of 9 is 2, which means we have 1 over f prime of 2 to evaluate. And now we're almost there. f prime of x is going to be 3x squared plus 3. So f prime evaluated at 2 is going to be 2 squared is 4 times 3 is 12 plus 3 is 15. And so our derivative, g prime, uh, evaluated at 9, is going to be 1 15th. Okay, I'm going to go to the next panel, and we're going to try uh, one, a numerical example. So here we see a table that has some selected values of x, f of x, and f prime of x. And we're going to try to find f inverse prime of negative 1. So I'm going to try this again. Remember, we're going to say that I'm going to call f inverse of x equal to g of x and say f of g of x is equal to x. Differentiating this, we'll get f prime of g of x times g prime of x is 1. So g prime of x is 1 over f prime of g of x. So for us, we want g prime of, uh, what did we say, negative 1. So we're looking for g prime of negative 1. So we want 1 over f prime of g of negative 1. So let's see if we can figure out what g of negative 1 is. So remember, we're trying to find f inverse of negative 1, which we don't know. But we know that if an x value for the inverse, and we're trying to find the y, that means for f, let me change colors there, for f, we want f of, what's that x value that will equal negative 1? That is, we want to find an x value that gives us a y value of negative 1, and that we can find here. So we can see that it's f of 0 that will equal negative 1. So for the ordered pair for f of 0, negative 1, 
means that for y, it's going to be negative 1, comma, 0. And so that's how we know that f inverse of negative 1 is going to be 0. And that means we're going to come here and say we're going to get 1 over f prime of uh, 0. And so f prime of x, let's see, what do we know? 1 over f prime of 0 is going to be right here, which is 4. And so that will give us a 1 fourth. All right, very good.